Generally, the flow presentation is about understanding it is about realizing that you might not be able to get everything. The information requirement might be that you don't require everything. But you just need a taste. You just need something to give a general idea about the um, about the kind of the work. Okay. So it's a very light. It's not deep. And it's also not extensive. It's just a, bit, a general taste of what um, of what the interface is like or about or what's required. And that's all that's required. So therefore, for our other work, as we were saying before, it might be if you haven't got enough time, you can tell them, well, how do I need another one? I can give you an idea, I can give you a taste of what people think, I can give you a taste of uh, what's required. Okay? Yeah, something superficial, but gives you something at least to start with. Okay, okay ideas for dissertation. Simple as that. The idea is that the dissertation is that the information requirements are, and you might need some ideas about something. You might not need to test anything, you might not need to um, get some uh, design going, you might just need ideas about what would be good, what would be good to, to commission, what would be good to develop. Okay? You might need to get that from other people, you might need to get that from work colleagues, that kind of thing. Yeah. Is this the main way to brainstorm? Um, well, I suppose in, all, in some ways it's not overly with the way of ideas of the situation. However, you'd expect, or I hope, that you, that you've run, if you wanted to get ideas, you've run something like um, focus groups or these kind of things, which has a bit more structure. It's not just people sitting there going, you know, it actually has some sort of structure to it. Yeah? Is much more um, qualitative. It's much more like uh, an informal uh, discussion about things, an informal um, sort of discussion about ideas, about evaluation. You can have it for both, you know, whether it's for the requirements of the dissertation or whether it's for evaluation. You can have this idea of informal informality. Um, and we might also, and we've got informal methods, remember, where we might have things like use cases, those are more informal than saying, you know, around. So that's more formal. So therefore, things that are documented correctly, it takes a lot more, might take a lot more time to do because you've got to have the right people with the right skills to do the modelling. With the evaluation, you might also think, well, it's got to be in a, a formal evaluation, in a formal setting with, you know, proper double blind, triple blind uh, experimentation. Yeah. Does surveys count as a formal way? Yes. Surveys and interviews, those kind of things. Well, interviews are slightly different than surveys because surveys are, I mean, you can give a survey verbally, but you're still marking it on a sheet, right? So an interview might be, might be more like, here's a question and you're getting um, qualitative feedback, you're getting verbal feedback. Whereas a survey is really about numeric, you know, ordinal feedback, if you like, where you actually have got something that, for most surveys, most people who do surveys over in social science are hardcore statisticians and they want to then get that data into a statistics package so they can get some quantit uh, quantitative output. Whereas interviews are often more rich, they're more discursive, they're actually you know, written outcomes. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, Presupposed outcome. Yeah, so 
That's it. Push those out and they've got the results. They know that the result is and they want it, and that's all the information you've got that they've got. Okay, good? Yeah? And ooh, we'll be sure. laboratory dissertation. setting, not ecologically valid, but you can control the confounding variables. Um, takes a lot more money, takes a lot more time, takes a lot more ethical approval to get. Okay, so that's kind of one where you've got lots of time, if you like, and you've got you've got to do this really well. So that might be the top level of quality that they want. Okay, that's your minutes out. So limitations. We're not going to do the I did have this originally intended for five minutes, but we're running out of time, so I'm just going to so limits. Time. I think it's time is obviously is obviously a limit. Okay, we've talked about this quite a lot, so it's obviously a limit of time. What about participants? Why am I to say participants are a limit? Yeah. If you can go back to the first course where uh, we had like a demographical bias within the participants. Yeah. That, that was a limit. So there might be a demographical bias within the um, uh, within the Participants, that's true, that's one limit, yeah. You can't, can't get enough. You can't get enough, yeah. In the you just can't get enough, it's that simple. You can't just can't get enough participants because you know they're difficult to get. So how might you um, uh, get around that? Mitigate for numbers. How might you get more than more people? Oh, I was gonna say that and um, there'll be drawing things. You you take them out and do work and then you look back at you use the same person. That's in the analysis, so that's called um, sampling with replacement yeah. or uh, bootstrapping in the analysis, yeah. But um, how many how many get more participants? The implications of the rules of the Yeah, you can have the implication of the rewards for people to complete the task, that's one thing. What kind of rewards might that be? Do the survey get entered into a few pounds a Do the survey like we do here and get entered into a hundred pound drawer. Draw for an iPad. You're on an essay. You're all that kind. Yeah. I have participated in something like that. You got an Amazon voucher. Amazon voucher. Yeah. So I mean, generally, you get an Amazon voucher. You could also, I mean, you know, when we do work with the BBC, anybody that goes and does the work there gets uh, part of it there. They get twenty-five quid uh, to cover the costs and that kind of thing. Um, it, or it's amazing what people do for chocolate. Strangely, you know, a large Mars bar. Seems to buy you about 45 minutes, strangely, and cost So, you know, large Mars bar seems to be the way forward. So, you know, you've got them to, you know, there's ways to get around this. Resources. Well, I think resources are quite obvious. You've got to understand what kind of resources you've got, what place, you know, where are you going to do this, what equipment are you going to have available when you're doing this, um, are you going to be in a private room, are you going to be in somebody's office, blah, blah, blah. So, resources. As are experimenters. How many people are there to do this work? Is there one of you? Is there two of you? You know that ThoughtWorks said that you know there might be one, two, four people, five people. Who knows? Depending on the size. So you need to think about those resources too. Um, even if there's one experimenter, the amount of if there's two experimenters because there's lots of people, the amount of work required isn't half if there's only half as many people. Okay, because there's lots of infrastructure set up that you, that you also need to do. So having just one person is probably never a good idea because it's never reduced to half. Okay, because there's an infrastructure cost. Um, skills. So what about skills? Why is that? skilled in, um, I don't know, the use cases, creating use cases and personas and scenarios, but you might not be skilled in UML uh, creation. Okay? So you might be skilled in in situ, in the wild, longitudinal studies, but you might not be skilled in tightly controlled 
the laboratory based students. So you have to recognize, if you're in, in, in a team, you have to recognize what the skills are. You can't just presume everybody's got the same skills. What are the skills, um, and how can you best distribute those skills to get a proper cohesive um, project, UX project? Um, and there's, there's these additional available skill sets. So instrumentation, data correct, collection, and data analysis. So some people uh, are better on, say, instrumentation. You know about eye tracking. They know about galvanic skin response. They know about understanding brain function. Okay. Some people might be better at collecting data. They might know all there is to know about a survey, about creating, or about creating, uh, grabbing a, a, a demographically valid um, set of interviews. You know, if they've worked for one of these political companies, you know, political survey companies, um, then they'll know all about that. Other people might be statisticians. They might be far more interested in analysis. Crap at instrumentation, crap at data collection, but they're really excellent at analysis, okay, and data analysis. So you've got to think about all these different aspects too. Okay, well we've had that. Now, let's move back on, let's move on to some other <coughs> interesting work. So, who's heard of Fred Brooks? One person, okay, we'll get to Fred Brooks in a bit, but you're going to have to think about Fred Brooks. So, this is, this is really something that you should consider. As computer scientists, you are all, whether you believe it or not, optimistic. Okay. You're all optimistic, whether you, whether you think you are or not, you're all more optimistic than you theoretically would be in most cases. Most computer scientists are, because we build software, we can build things, we can create our own worlds, we are God. Okay? We're optimistic. All the time. That's what we are. And that's a big problem, being optimistic. So as you access, you'll be optimistic. Of course we can create this, of course we can create that. It's just a technical thing to get over. It's no problem. Okay? But that almost is a problem. Okay? Because you might not be able to create the things you think you can, but official engineers and think you can. But also, it might very well be that you give a time frame which is just ridiculous. Okay. So when, when we look at the commissioners, a lot of the commissioning constraints, a lot of the commissioners are software engineers and software engineers build stuff and because they build stuff they think they're God and because they think they're God, well they only allow you a certain amount of time because well, it's optimistic you've got to give them that time. The rule of thumb is decide on the time that you think, you think it's going to take it, double it and have an add one. Okay. That's what it is. Because it's just going to take longer than you think. So optimism is the key downfall. So when you're doing all of your UX work, think about the fact that you're optimistic by nature, even though you might not think you are, you are. Okay? And so be more cautious, be less optimistic, be more pessimistic about what you're going to be able to achieve in the time frame you're given. Okay? That's the first thing. That's what lets us down. In the real world, optimism screws us over. Alright. So, Brooks. Before we go on to that, tell me about Brooks. Um, he wrote The Mythical Man Month. The Mythical Man Month, awesome book. It's all about yes. software development uh, disasters. Like, you just said Times by Two and a Half Miles, I think originally it was multiplied by three and then multiplied by three again. Yeah. And then 20 years later, it was just multiplied by three as we've uh, developed more software engineering practices. So yeah, so I mean, Brooks, Brooks's book, well, anybody else can to say about Brooks, we'll start. So look at my book, Brooks's book, it all comes from, all the, all the lessons that he put together are all coming from his experience developing the IBM 360 operating system, right? So it's not just that he's gone and collected this stuff or he's blah, blah, blah. He was the manager of that, okay, for that project. So, managed to develop IBM's three system, the system 360 using the RS 360 um, software support package. Um, with the man month, we've all talked about, winner of the National Level of Technology and is the 1999 jury award winner. So he's a really, he's a, the, the book and the, his ideas on 
project, man project management and how this all works in real life is really important and it's really interesting to see. Because these are direct lessons and a lot of them are still, very, are still directly lessons today. So, this is part of optimism. If we add more people to a project, we get these massive benefits. More people equals more massive benefits. Okay. So, that means that what we can see here, we've got months up here, this is how long it's going to take you to complete the task. More men, more people. More people added to it means that we can see this nice reduction. But, this only happens if you've got perfectly partitionable tasks that each individual can do on their own. So, only manpower to a late software project makes it later. Why do you think it makes it later? So even if it's not the end, even if it's halfway through, yeah, people don't have an idea of what's happened before. Anything else? Yeah? Uh, the slowing down of the people who were there before because they've got to communicate. Yeah, the, the slowing down of people who were there before because they've got to communicate to them. Also, there's a training effect, so people need to be off the training on the tools that a big organization uses because they might be different. They might be trained on the ethos, the way that code is built. There's lots of additional training effect. And are all the tasks perfectly partitionable? No. Most tasks are not perfectly partitionable. So when we have more people on this on the uh, on, on the uh, 360, they've got a flat line because most people had unpartitioned tasks. It didn't actually go up for some of them, it was for, uh, for ta on the task front, it didn't go up, but they weren't partitioned. So it doesn't matter how many people you add, the tasks aren't partitioned mostly. So you always, if you add people midway through, you're always going to get a later from the project. That was just, that's just his idea. So you need to have enough people at the start for the same. You need to have the same amount of people at the start as you do at the finish. Because, so you need to plan at the start for how many people you need because there's always an effect of learning, communication, training, uh, taking time away for the newbie, new, newbies as they come in. This is also the case if you're adding people piecemeal. So if you have one person or two people one month, two or three people the second month, four or five people the third month, you start to get more patterns of things are going wrong. You'll start to get this training effect, this late run in kind of a wave going down the project. Yeah? Surely, though, if you talk quite early on in the project, you go, right, okay, we haven't got enough people for this, you can only have one, we'll go two of us, and you bring someone in, and say, there's still six months to run. Okay, it may take a couple of weeks or a few weeks to get that person up and run, but actually, the time that one person spent training that person up. Yeah, so if it's actually the if it's early, if it's not too late, if it's early on in the project, that's very true. Um, but secondly, you've also got to think that if it's a, the, in a small scale project where there's just two of you and you've got another one, then the communication can be, you know, you might not need for the training because there's this communication that's going on. But it's still going to reduce the two people who are already on that project, it's going to really reduce their, um, their time as well because of the training effects, etc. So, you know, you've got this wave coming down, and whether the tail of the wave finishes before the project finishes, or whether it kicks out in the project, it really depends on when you start people, and how many you start. The earlier the better. The earlier the better, yeah, the earlier the better. Okay. Second system effect. When it comes to creating the second version, the developers are buoyed by their expertise and mastery of the first system, and try to cram in as many of the flourishes and embellishments from the first system as possible. So what happens is, that you create your version 1 in the old version, you create your version 1 system, and you've kept it exactly as what, to what people think. But as you've done this, people have been creating on, uh, what is it, you know, GitHub, or Zero, or all this. Oh, we want uh, features, we want new features, new features, new features. In the first version, you're not just bothered about doing what's there, okay? You're just bothered about making sure that your original specification is complete, because you need a working system. You're not going to do anything else. Come version two, you see all these feature requests and you think, yes, let's have these features because we've got the first one. 
in order to do version one, we're optimistic, we are God, everybody loves this one, nothing will fail. Okay? And so therefore we have a second system. We get the second system with all of the requests added into it. And it creates a nightmarish Frankenstein system of, you know, much like Microsoft Word. Where we start off with a nice clean interface, start off with everything nice and clean, and then we start to add features and features and features because we've been requested by one person at some point in the past. So that's called the second system of that. And then the second system becomes a horrible, bloated Frankenstein nightmare. Okay? So that's something to remember. Make sure that when you come to building the second system, you don't have to address everybody's requirements. You only have to address maybe the features that most people want. Okay? And how can you maintain those created by, how can you maintain the simplicity of the decomplexity of the interface without adding all these additional features yet still getting, still making sure that some of the most important ones are enacted? It's not your job to try and think about every single interface change that's required from everybody. Only the ones that you think are going to benefit. Inaccuracy. What seems like short delays or inconsistencies in the work can expand into very major delays. Okay, this is your optimistic uh, timing as well. So in this case, the timing is you know what your optimism is for the creative time frame in your project is key. So we can see here that we've got uh, programming rates, and we can see that we've got the predicted programming rate, uh, yes. We can see we've got the monthly estimate of the program size, which you know. It's the estimate of program size, but it doesn't really move much. It's not really going to look very big. But the actual programming rate is, is actually a lot slower than what's predicted. Okay? So you're almost going to under, you're almost going to predict better than you're going to do. Okay? We can also see this with debugging rates. So we've got this nice prediction of debugging rates that goes up here and then levels up. Okay? But actually it doesn't. Up here, and we get more and more goods as we get more and more code. And it doesn't matter that, it just keeps going until we decide we're not going to do any more and release it. But there's stuff for the books, mostly. We don't catch everything, we don't flash everything. Okay? So you're always going to be worse than you think. Okay, and then the other one, which might be slightly different now, well, I'm not quite sure. Is this idea of a throwaway project. The first project, Brooks like said, the first, first system that you build, you give a chip away. Because the first system is your training system. Okay? The first system is the one that you're going to get your ideas, do your ideas, and sort of um, get them more mature, and then you need to build the, the real system for that. The first one's the training system. Now, with agile development, you might suggest, well, maybe this is the case anymore. In fact, Brooks says something very similar. He says that with new, with new agile techniques in development, you might not have this this um, uh, throwaway project because every iteration is a kind of throwaway project. We're iterating all the time, so there's no version. Um, I think that's probably not right. I think that, that, that you create even in the iterations, you create a small um, system that you then have to change again as part of each iteration. So I don't think it's necessarily right. Yeah. I think mean, this is uh, related. And so these things are, I mean, he's saying that we don't, we don't, we, um, we don't have, you know, we are job development, we don't have this so much anymore. I think actually we probably do, from my opinion, from my experience of our job development, even in each of the agile um, sprints, you have something, you solve some, you have some code which you often really like to get. You don't just do it and that's it, it's specified. You often are really writing it a lot. So you make it. My net second system yeah. is in every split often. Okay. Uh, okay. I don't know if it's changes I'm going to say. Um, changes happen. So one thing that's going to have to work at daily part 
I mean, if I was doing this in a not in an after the design uh, stage, I'd be using things like RESTful interfaces. I'd be using things like remote procedure calls, that kind of thing, because then you've got the interface calling you know, RESTful APIs, if you like. So they're highly decoupled. Um, or remote procedures, so they're highly decoupled from the interface and how that interface is presented. Okay. And then you could also think, what should be modular? We can see this um, in apps. So apps often aren't bloated. Apps do one job, and one job well. So but you can also see that most apps have kind of an ecosystem of apps around them. Okay, so, um, work, uh, what is it? Um, I work for the, um, for the Mac or for the, or for the, for the iPad. Okay? Those are little sets of applications that do one job. And that's it. So you can extend them to just something to think about. It's a good rationale for highly decoupled interfaces when you're building interfaces. Um, become highly uh, highly partition, enabling the user experience people to build up different interfaces for each member of this family of related projects. Now, how does this relate to the first thing? We, one of the first things we were talking about. Yeah.
Uh, at this stage, you need qualitative results. How do you go about 